question. I don't want you to know how to do it, but you still get the right answer. How are we doing, guys? Have we got anything figured out yet? Do it again. Nine. Uh, looks like Oren's got an idea what he's doing. How many of them are? Did I make a little paper cut out so I could do it? I was about to do the wrong thing for one of them, and then I realized I just asked for the most different Yeah, that's... That's what, that's what Mr. Anderson was saying at the beginning, right? I, I don't get Want to be the lazy one. Canadian here. How do you know that? I'm like, wait, Being the lazy Canadian. Very good. Oh, somebody just got a brainstorm. What do you think, Karen? Does your head hurt yet? I, f I know that um, one has to be one. Okay. Is this correct? We're going to find out afterwards. Yes, it is. So this, is what, this, is what, this is what we got taught by Mr. McFarland the other day. What? Something, something about this. Oh, area. No. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about some questions here. Okay. Ladies, girls, can I get you up here with me? I don't want you to miss any of this. All right. Now, first rule. If you're going to do the Gauss contest, the Gauss contest is multiple choice questions. You'll notice that there are some questions at the end of this that aren't multiple choice, but they're just good grade seven and eight. Ones I look at are multiple choice questions in, in most cases. The reason that we want to look at multiple choice questions is so that we get a couple of things that we can use that help us solve stuff. And I love the fact we got some grade fours in here who are maybe missing a couple pieces of math because I want to say that's not going to stop you from doing a multiple choice. So the first question I've got for you. If I have a math multiple choice question that has five answers, how many of the answers are right? One. one. Exactly one. Most important, you know there is one right answer. Because you see the first question, some teachers and students would look at and say, uh oh, that's a, an equation. I've got to learn how to solve equations. I might not learn that until grade seven or eight. However, you might look at it and say, there's only five possible answers. I wonder what one works. And if the four ones work, or if the four ones don't work, then it's obvious to make the fifth answer that you can't solve. Correct, and I'm going to come back to that idea in a minute. And so if you tried four and put in and said six plus four is ten, and ten divided by twenty, well, I can reduce it to one half which is the answer on the right. I have the answer and I don't have to go beyond the second one. You might have tried 10 and found out it didn't work, but as soon as you tried four and it did, stop. Don't do any more work, you're done. It's the only answer. Okay, number two. I love you guys getting your calculators out and doing all of that stuff, but let's remind yourself about one little piece of mathematics. If I write down the number 2,407, let me say that again, 2,407, why do I know that? Because I know that my places are the units on the right, then the tens, 
then the hundreds, then the thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, million. You guys have learned all that. As a matter of fact, could I not write this number as two times one thousand plus four times one hundred plus seven times one? Actually, this question is not about bedmas. This question is not about calculators. This question is knowing your number system. And I heard a couple great things. A few people looked at this and said, I like the way you said it, uh, because it's three times one, there's got to be a three on the end. Boy, three times one, there's got to be a three on the end. So I guess the answer is not E. And the answer is not C. We've just taken it from a 1 in 5 chance of getting it right to a 1 in 3. Then I said, well, why didn't you use the 6,000? Why? Because there's 6 times 10,000. 6 times 10,000 is 60,000. That's way bigger. So it's not that one. 50-50. And then what you might notice on this one is there's 4 times 10. 4 times 10 is 40. And there's nothing times 100. There's no hundreds in this. There's tens. Which means the D is there. There's the right answer. Are all the questions answered? No. So it's like any full number. Okay, number four. I've got a view going here that I don't like. I'll uh, get out of it later. Number four. Again, I like this question a lot. You read through all the garbly goop in here about integers and no fractions and negatives or zeros. And I love the grade four response. What does that first thing mean? Six with the little two up there. Tell me what that means. And I'm a grade four right now. I don't know. Put your hands down. Sorry, guys, grade sixes and stuff like that. Who cares? You know what? Grade five. So I look at that question and I say, I don't know what 6 squared is because I'm a grade 4 and I've never learned it. Great. I guess I better not do the question. But I ask the question and I said, do you know what odd is? Oh yeah, I know what odd is. So let me ask you this. If we figured out what B, C, D, and E were, get the answer. if one of them is odd, it's the right answer. Because remember, only one answer is right. And, and, what if none of them are right? Then A is, even though I don't know what it is. That's important problem writing, problem solving on a multiple choice question. As it turns out, I don't have my calculator. 6 squared is 6 times 6, which is even. If I take an odd number and subtract an odd number, because I don't know that 23 minus 17 is 6, but I know that an odd minus an odd gives me an even, so I don't even do it. I look at part C. I have an odd number times 24. I don't have my calculator, but I know an odd times an even is an even, so I'm not even going to do the question. If I looked at part E and saw an even number divided by an even number, well, I'm not really sure what that is, but I don't like division anyways. Especially when I've got part D, 30 times 27. I happen to know that an odd times an odd is an odd. I don't even know that that's 81. I just know that an odd times an odd is an odd. That's got to be the right answer without really doing much work. Lazy Canadian. And grade fours can do questions that they don't know about. They have to know some of them, right? Number six. I told you way too much information. You guys are way too smart for this. So I'm going to make the question a little bit harder. Ah. 
There we go. You can still see it on our sheets, though. Yeah, I know, but I didn't need to tell you that that was five and the top was four. I didn't have to tell you that. That's amazing. Most of you have realized if I talk about the area of this thing, if I take this big rectangle and I cut a corner out of it, that the area got smaller. Okay, no problem there. So now all you do is figure out whether the perimeter was bigger, smaller, or stay the same. Now I guess some of you figured it out that, that maybe because there were more lines to be added up it was going to get bigger, but really you figured out all the pieces and added them up and found out it was the same, right? Well, hang on here. Let's look at something for a second. Let's look at something. Come here, you. Need another color. If I talk about this thing vertically, we know that from there to there is six, right? Well, I don't know that this is five anymore, but I know whatever that piece is, and this little piece up here, that those two pieces, this one and this one, have got to add up to six as well. Okay. Still goes from bottom to top. And all the way across the bottom is eight. So the two pieces that make up horizontal, they've got to be eight. So it's got to stay the same. The answer is the end. The end. Okay, you guys watch it quick? Yeah. It's E. <laughs> Okay, down to the bottom one. You read carefully each one of the boxes. You're going to put in these numbers. Three, five, six, seven, and eight. And then you're going to subtract the two-digit number from the three-digit number, and they want the smallest difference. What's your logic if you want the smallest difference? Smallest difference. If you want something small subtracting, take a small subtract big. What's the smallest three digit number? Um, 356. And what's the biggest two digit number? 87. And when you subtract them, which answer do you get? Which one? Go ahead. ABC? 269. 269. Yeah, oh, beginning. There it is. Boy, oh boy, i got to figure out what's going with my pen now. There's a one. Wait, which one is right? 269. 269. They're dreaded 15. I was working on this one. Now, I want to get on to something else. Put 15. Guys. Hang on, you can talk about this later. Number 15. Okay. The most key spot on your grid is the middle spot. This spot right here. Right in the middle. Right? And it's the most key spot because I know four of the other 15. symbols that are be around it on the four wings that go out from it. Which symbol should you put in the key spot? And why? Which symbol and why? The white circle, the open circle, if you want. And why do you why do you put it in the middle? It's on every block. It's the only one that's on every block. Is the open circle. So you need to put an open circle right there. Okay. Key. Right, the uh, one on the tail, you can put whatever symbol you want on it. Okay? Again, guys, all of these questions, there are solutions. There's a solution book. You can do them all and check the solutions over the next week. I didn't. I left it. Question. Why put the little star on the jiggy thing in the middle and it's still back to me? Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Is there only one answer for that question? There's only one answer for the, all the questions. No, that one can have multiple okay. answers to the tail to do the
It would be very wrong of us if we... I Googled it. I Googled cool jobs that require high mathematics. Okay? And here's what I came up with. They're not my jobs. I just sort of found a list. We can talk about it. Number one, cartoons. What? I have a cousin who's been a lead animator in everything in cartoons from Bugs Bunny and the Jetsons and all that stuff right up to Mummies Alive and the Fantastic Four. Barry lives in Thailand. When I last saw him, I asked him what's changed in cartoons. And when he started doing Bugs Bunny, he would draw the picture of Bugs Bunny maybe coming out of his hole. And then maybe over here, Bugs Bunny kiffing, kicking Daffy Duck. Okay? And then he'd draw what happened 10 seconds later, 10 seconds later. He sort of did the whole story by drawing what's called the key frames. He would draw those. And the reason he lives in Thailand is that in Thailand and Indonesia, there were lots and lots of very artistic people willing to work for very little money. It's the way of our world. And these people would then almost trace out what he did, but each time they'd have Bugs Bunny, maybe his arm moving a little bit as he brings the carrot up to his mouth, right? Takes a bite, back down, and as he's walking across. So each picture they would draw would be slightly different to make the movement. They would run a fast slideshow, and across he'd go. And, he, and across they'd walk. They've fired all of those artists now. All of them. Barry still draws the key pictures every 10 seconds or so, and now everything it takes for Bugs Bunny to go from here to over there and kick Daffy Duck is vector mathematics and video rastering. Computer science and mathematics together, so he morphs as he walks across smoothly. And the trees all go back and forth in the breeze at the same time, and the light all comes from the sun, and the shadows on the ground are perfect, because it's done mathematically. So basically stop motion? All sorts, it's called, it's called morphing, is the right word. If you want to be in the movies, be a mathematician. The movie Avatar had more mathematicians and computer scientists working on it than there were actors, including all the bit actors doing the fight scenes and running around in the forest. Fantastic opportunity for high-end mathematics here. Computer scientists, this one's pretty obvious, but I'd like to introduce you to the guy in the middle. His name is Bogdan Frasina. A couple years ago, Bogdan was named one of the top 30 most influential people in Canada under 30 years old. Former student of mine, Bogdan worked while he was a high school student. For me, he worked at Research in Motion, the Blackberry. This is a long way back, but he was employed, shh, guys later, I had to talk after. But he, he was employed 22. And the BlackBerry at that time was a little pager device with two lines of screen that you could scroll your uh, email through. And they had a development meeting and were brainstorming. And this high school student said to Mike Lazaridis, who's the main person from BlackBerry, he said, I think that we're going to have to get this to work on a cell phone. I expect we're going to need a color screen, probably an MP3 player. Sounds like a smartphone. Mike Lazaridis said, no, I don't think it'll ever happen. Guess what? It did. BlackBerry, the first smartphone, and this guy predicted it before it happened. He was a high school student. He came to me after high school with an idea about doing data compression, zip files and RAR files, for who knows about it, uh, using fractals. It didn't work, but we worked on compression and broke the world record for image compression. The guy who we beat was from Russia, Alexander Ratushniak. Alex is the best in the world in all sorts of data compression. He was smart. Can't beat him, join him. We opened up a company and hold almost every world record there is for data compression. But the best thing is that company doesn't even operate. It's mothballed because we have another one. It's called Desiro Labs. Desiro Labs is the fastest growing company in Canada. When you watch the Olympics coming up, you will see almost everything that's not inside an arena or a physical structure will be coming using a Desiro box from every major television company in the world. The way it works, take a video camera, hook it up to our device, and you're live. 
using cellular networks. Sony, one of the biggest companies in the world, tried to do it for two years, couldn't get it to work. We sat down and got it to work in about two weeks. This guy is one of the brightest guys in the world. We're all right. Yeah, I'm okay? Yep. One of the brightest guys in the world. Uh, any of you on Facebook, Facebook is going to change because he went and spent a day with Mark Zuckerberg and told him how to fix it. Okay? The guy is brilliant. He was fantastic on math contests. He won the Canadian Computing Contest outright. He problem solves business problems. He problem solves computer science problems. He problem solves math problems. And he problem solves any computer stuff that shows up, hardware stuff that shows up. Okay? He is fantastic. When we hire people for this company, whether it's somebody who works for business for us, a secretary, we ask how they did on math contests. Our head secretary won the contest for her school. Because in the high tech world, you've got to be able to problem solve, you've got to be able to be moving at a very fast rate, or you don't survive. Computer game design. Okay? When you guys have to figure out the levels, that's a lot of problem solving. But think about the person who put the levels together that you have to figure out. Hopefully without the cheat codes. Right? Oh. Forensic science, CSI. The amount of problem solving these people do, like the one there is where the bullets came from, it must have been a different shooter or whatever, whatever. The amount of problem solving going on there is fantastic. Chris Hadfield. Chris Hadfield, when he was in China, he was the commander of the space station. He was up there doing his thing. And uh, he's, he's going to be lecturing at the University of Waterloo. He's a friend of ours. When you met Dean, Dean was his math teacher. Top math contest student, top athlete, and pretty good guitar player, too. You better be pretty smart if you're going to be commander of the space station. Because if something goes wrong and you can't fix it, you don't come home. Simple. Cryptography. Cryptography, quite simply, in the old days was, how do I get a message to my people in the war that if the other side gets it, they can't decipher, right? Back in the old days. Today, it's if I do banking on my phone, Somebody doesn't get in and steal all the money out of my bank. Cryptography on my phone's great. We talked a bit about quantum computers. If we build a quantum computer, all cryptography we have today doesn't work. We need unbelievable people to build the quantum computers. We also need unbelievable people to do things like cryptography so the quantum computers don't ruin us. And again, I'll get back to you at the end, okay? No, it's about... I'll get back to you. No problem. Statistician, I've never really thought statistician was too cool, but it was in the list, so I've got it up there. Architect, that's the Sale Hotel in Dubai, a seven-star hotel that's built on a floating island. Seven stars? Do you know how dumb that is to build a hotel on a floating island? Very dumb. It's so dumb that they're doing another one. They're building another floating island with the world's largest Ferris wheel on it. Yeah. Yeah. But guys, anybody in here interested in being a doctor? Medical doctor. My interventional radiologist. Okay. True story. Uh, about 15 years ago, my father had a heart attack. And after his heart attack and he recovered from it, they went in and they did a whole bunch of tests on him. And he was going in, they were going to open him up and do double bypass surgery on his heart. I have surgery. When they went in, opened him up, the doctor took a look and went, uh oh. That isn't what all of the uh, um, tests and so on showed me. This isn't what I was expecting. I think they left my dad off, opened up on the table, and went away and Googled what to do next. I'm not sure it's Googling when you're doing it for medical stuff. But they went to look to see what do you do in this situation. And there was nothing out there on what to do for my father. And I know if this doctor wasn't a good doctor, what he would have done is closed my dad, sewn him back up, and the next time he had a heart attack, and he would, He'd be dead. But this doctor sat there and went, you know what? It isn't about what's in the book and all of that. What if I do this? That would fix that problem, but that would cause this problem. But if I do this, I could do that to solve that. In the end, he did five bypasses, a quintuple bypass in a way that's never been done before, written up in all the medical journals. Fifteen years later, my dad is alive and well. He's got an office around the corner from me. 
Every math contest that comes out, he's the last person to get it. He's the last person to read through it, proof it, and say, yes, it's okay to go out. Been doing it for 50 years now. And in his mid-80s, we still go fishing and that together. Because this doctor knew what he was doing. Guys, here's my biggest message to you today. You're not learning mathematics here so that you become really good at, at, at doing your number facts. So you get, don't become very good at doing algebra, geometry, or whatever it is you're learning. Those are just areas that you learn to train your brain to think. The best method you guys have to train your brain to be an ultimate problem solver is to work on mathematics and computer science. By the way, computer science is just another math. That's all it is. Right? The other type. And the higher level math you do, the better you will train your head. The better you train your head, the better problem solver you will be. And the best problem solvers get the best jobs. End of discussion. Back to our list. Great problem solvers have all the good jobs right now. And it's cool to be a geek. That's the other thing I want to say. It's cool to be a geek. It didn't used to be, but now it's cool to be a geek. And so be a geek, do the math contest, learn the, as much as you go here. I hear some of you have grumbled that you've been doing some hard mathematics in this class. Good. You guys are lucky. You're so much luckier than other kids in your spot. I hope it gets harder for you. Oh, it is. And I hope you accept the challenge to have it be harder. It will make you a better mathematician. And in our world, we need great mathematicians. That's why Bill Gates sent me out. That's what I'm doing here. Right? Okay.